wait, wait for people to scurry out of the room before I get started. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon and we will try to keep it lively since it is the you know kind of post lunch lull here for us. Uh, I am here, uh, I'm Katie Greenleaf Martin and I'm from the cons consortium in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm here with some uh, colleagues of mine, both from Pennsylvania and from North Carolina. And we're gonna talk today a little bit about how we're handling uh, staff, account security. We're going to talk about our approaches and about what we're doing. Uh, as you'll see, very much a work in progress, and we are both at very different places in this progress. So hopefully uh, we provide you with some tools that you may be interested in using, some ideas, as well as some food for thought and discussion if we have time. So as I mentioned, I'm Katie Greenleaf Martin. I am the executive director of the Pennsylvania Integrated Library System, and I have one of my colleagues with me today. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Davis. I'm the uh, project, no support, I always get this wrong, it's embarrassing. It's on the slide too, uh, support and project management specialist. I'm Benjamin Murphy, I'm the NC Cardinal Program Manager. And I'm Llewellyn Marshall, NC Cardinal Application Administrator and Developer. So what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of start with our consortium in Pennsylvania and talk about what our status quo is in terms of staff account management and some of the things that we've started doing, some of the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, and then we will hand it over to our North Carolina friends to talk about what they are doing uh, right now and their future plans as well. Then they're going to walk us through uh, some infrastructure they have created in their evergreen installation for password resets uh, and, and doing those on a schedule based on the age of the password. So we're going to talk kind of through the mechanics of that. And then hopefully we'll have a little time for questions and discussion. Okay. So account management uh, for staff entails. Um, so we have local library administrators. Uh, they usually tend to be library directors, sometimes circulation managers, um, IT folks. Uh, mostly everybody has one or sometimes they're the same person and they all wear the same hat. So that's fun. Um, and they are able to assign circ clerks, you know, basic circulation functions, circ supervisors, you know, those obviously it's in the title, they're supervisors. Uh, they can assign fellow uh, local admins and local cataloger permissions. So those are people who have not participated in any uh, official uh, quiz or certification and can do uh, local holdings. And then at that point, if you need additional cataloging permissions, we as Spark Support uh, assign copy and original catalogers uh, after they've participated in a training uh, module and quiz certification. Uh, when I started in February in 2022, I said to Katie, I go, this is something that's really important. I think we need to turn on um, the feature that came in in, um, I think it was 3.7, to be able to block uh, expired uh, staff accounts from logging in. So we kind of got the ball rolling uh, pretty quickly. So in March, we batch updated anybody who had had activity in the last year uh, to expire this summer, so June 1st, uh, 2023. And then on June 1st, 2022, we turned on the block and we gave everybody a heads up and said, you know, this is, this is happening. Um, and we turned it on and we set up our notification methods and I'll go through those uh, in the next slide. Um, and then starting in June through September, we did trainings, we did uh, updated documentation, lots of screenshots, because this is something that staff really didn't understand, I think. They, they thought, you know, patron registration is not the same as staff. They saw those as two different things. So we really wanted to make sure they understood that as a user, you're, you're both people in, in the accounts. 
So um, we went through all of that. And then we started contacting individual libraries and updating accounts, making sure they had email addresses, making sure uh, the accounts actually needed to be held. Uh, we found a lot of accounts that have, people had left, which was a little concerning. Um, but we got a lot of that cleaned up. Um, we marked inactive and former staff as inactive. We expired the permissions. We changed the passwords, we removed email addresses. Uh, we really tried to, you know, hammer in the fact that like, this is really important. The, like, for me, like the minute someone leaves your employment, you should turn off access to something as important as your ILS. Um, so we tried to provide that. And that took pretty much all summer because we had a lot of accounts and a lot of email addresses to update. Um, and then we we entered what I call maintenance mode, uh, just again, working on updating accounts that were missing email addresses um, as they were getting added, updating um, any accounts that had really weird expiration dates. For some reason, we had staff that weren't expiring until 2030. And I'm like, how, how did that happen? So uh, we've been doing a lot of that cleanup. And then on Monday this week, I emailed everyone and said, hey, you know, starting June 1st, your account is expired. You're not going to be able to log in. So don't wait, act now, update your accounts. So probably not the best to go on a conference and then tell all your customers, you have to submit tickets to update your uh, accounts, but we're, 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 good. we're doing pretty good. Actually, I think uh, getting them updated. Um, so, uh, it's so for May, we're going to be sending out reminders. Um, hopefully we don't have to do too many trainings, but uh, we're kind of got that in the, the back of our minds, knowing that we may need to do that. So for our notifications, we are going to be emailing all the staff. Some staff have their own address. Some staff, their emails are going to their directors. We have a new action trigger set up for just staff accounts, and it'll remind them at 30 days expiring, and then we send them another reminder if it wasn't updated 10 days prior. Um, I also get a report uh, for the accounts that are expiring in the month coming, so I email those uh, contacts and just say, hey, just so you know, here are all of your accounts that are going to expire. Please let me know if you need help updating them, um, and uh, they've been pretty good about getting back to me and updating the thing, all their accounts. We uh, also monitor, again, the new staff accounts that get added so that they have that contact information in there. And then we, again, go through the process of updating people who have left the employment of the library. So some hurdles that we've encountered. Everyone has shared accounts, I know. Um, and we're finding those to be uh, for circulation and cataloging functions. Um, so that's you know, something that we're going to be approaching and talking to our users group about, you know, shared accounts are convenient, but they're not the most secure. Uh, a lot of staff are inheriting an account, like, hey, I, you know, cataloger left, and we have a new cataloger, and they just, they get that account, and they get that updated password, and they update the email address, but they also then inherit all of those permissions that potentially they may have not, I don't want to say earned, but they haven't taken the qualifications to have been granted yet. Um, and we also have some cataloging permissions that were quote unquote grandfathered in. They're accounts that they just need to be able to add an ILL or they need to be able to do one specific function in account, but need all of like the head or original cataloger permissions. So we're gonna be, um, kind of approaching them and making sure that they've taken the class, maybe recertifying them just to make sure that they actually um, got the updated training uh, now that we're on 3.9. And um, something that we are a little concerned about is that there's not a way to make certain uh, fields required when you're registering a staff versus a patron. It's all in one form. So it's kind of hard to say, well, you need to require the email address for these, but not for patrons. So um, that would be something uh, that we would like to see. Um, so for us, for next steps are definitely cleaning up all those shared accounts. Um, it's probably not gonna make us a lot of fans, but I think it's ultimately the best option. We definitely wanna start doing routine uh, password updates, which so we're really excited to see uh, Llewellyn's work. 
We definitely want to do food two factor in some fashion. We know that a lot of the libraries have staff or volunteers who potentially, you know, might not have the technical skills to do two factor in some ways. So we have to kind of approach that in a very gentle way. Um, we definitely want to look at permissions. Um, we, I feel like we had a lot of permissions and then we kind of scaled back and consolidated a lot. And now I think we really need to reevaluate that and maybe even break it out further. I definitely want a reports permission set. I want to set for acquisitions and hopefully make that tiered. And then serials, because you know, if you're cataloging magazines, you don't need to have the same permissions as someone who can impart mark records and original cataloging. Um, we're also exploring a little uh, admin certification process as well as updating uh, a privacy waiver for reports. Um, I, I don't know how we'll do that one, but I've been researching everyone else who does them. <laughs> so um, I'll be excited to get that started. So I will hand it over to Benjamin. It's interesting to hear we're doing a lot of the same things. So um, it's good to see some similarities there. So with Evergreen's move to a web accessible staff client, one of our concerns was that staff members would be able to leave their library system and still have access to the staff client via the internet if the login accounts weren't shut down in a timely manner, or if passwords on shared staff accounts weren't regularly changed. So some consortia have addressed this by not allowing shared logins or by restricting the ability to assign a workstation to a supervisor account. We allow shared login accounts for circulators, but not for catalogers or for administrators. So we don't have restrictions on which staff can register a workstation. So in order to address our concerns, we first needed to figure out what the technical logistics of what we we're able to do. In order to know what was feasible, we worked, uh, or once we knew what was feasible, we worked with our user experience group and our governance committee to draft and implement a policy. So what we came up with was a policy and a mechanism for this phase of the process that requires staff to change a login account every 90 days. So let me give you a little bit of a background on the steps that led up to implementing this policy. In 2019, we undertook a project to simplify our patron permissions. We started off with 35 permission groups and got it down to 12. This experience inspired us to take on the task of rethinking our staff permissions to make better use of Evergreen's inheritance structure. We went through every permission assignment and reconsidered which permission group should have which privileges. The new permission structure was designed so that bibliographic catalogers are the only ones that can edit or import bibliographic records that are shared by the whole consortium. Item cataloger permissions allow all the other cataloging tasks, including item and call number level editing. As a part of this process, we developed cataloging best practices for the consortium and designed assessments that catalogers need to pass before they're granted a specific level of cataloging privileges. So in order to help us with the management of staff accounts, we've also established our system login access managers group. So we call them our SLAMs. This group is comprised of one point of contact per system who's responsible for creating, managing, and uh, terminating staff accounts at that system. So each quarter we send out an email to SLAMs that alerts them of their staff accounts at their system that are set to expire within the next three months. This helps them to monitor for accounts of staff members that left recently. We also alert them to any staff accounts that haven't changed their password in more than 90 days so that they can follow up with those users. So here are a few of the different login account policies that we've implemented over time. We don't allow shared logins for accounts other than CERC and CERC lead. Permissions to add and edit cataloger accounts are restricted to the Cardinal team. So once a staff member passes a cataloging assessment, their SLAM can create a circulator account and then someone on the Cardinal team can elevate their privileges to the correct cataloging group. Accounts cannot be reused if a staff member leaves. So we suggest configuring reports on a shared CERC account, which allows multiple users to access the report output. We have a process for sharing report templates on terminated accounts so that they can be cloned by other accounts. Staff are responsible for changing their own passwords. So even if they can't edit their own account in the uh, staff law, uh, interface, like catalogers or administrators, they can reset their password in the My Account section of the OPAC. Staff are prevented from logging in to expired or inactive accounts, and passwords need to be changed every day. So Llewellyn will talk about how we implemented these requirements here in a moment. 
So other things that's on our mind, you know, after implementing these changes, we received requests from external vendors for API access to our Evergreen instance. We reached out to other consortia and our hosting provider and learned that this kind of access is not common or well-documented. We discovered that a vendor was using SIP credentials we had provided to access our API because our SIP accounts included staff login permissions. So we had to work with a vendor to learn what API calls they wanted to make and look through the code and test to find out which permissions those recalls required while locking down access to only the calls needed for their purposes. So this also led to more scrutiny of our SIP accounts, their permissions, and making sure that the dormant accounts were removed if not in use. We've also heard from our state Department of Technology that we may need to implement multi-factor authentication in the future. So we're thinking about what that would mean and how to, to differentiate access requirements for patrons, staff, and administrators. So with that, I'll hand it over to Llewellyn. Thank you. So I'm gonna briefly go over the code changes that we've made at NC Cardinal to implement our new password requirements and the changes that we have on the horizon. So we split our large password project into three smaller phases. In our first phase, we, which we pushed out to production last year, we wanted a way for Evergreen to tell users when their passwords were too old. The first step in our implementation of this was to expose the parts of the user password database table that we needed. Our new password set date class accesses that password table, but it only gives Evergreen the user's ID and the date that the password was set. Next, we needed a way to define the period of time a password would remain valid for. For that, we created a new org unit setting called password reset age. When a staff member logs in, their password set date is compared against that password reset age setting. If the age of their password is greater than that, then we throw up a red warning message on the staff splash screen to let them know. We've talked about completely shutting out the user from the staff client until they've updated it, but we haven't pursued that yet. And if you can see on the patron update screen, we've also added a note that shows you how old a patron's password is. That's a really handy feature. The last thing we needed was a way to email users when it's about time to update their passwords again. So to trigger our new notification, we created a hook called au.passwordchange that fires off whenever a user updates their password. Then we needed to create a patron old password validator that ensures that the, page, that the uh, user has not updated their password again since that hook was fired off. Other than that, our action trigger was just like the basic boilerplate email notice. So these new notices go out every 76 days and we chose 76 days so that staff would have a full two weeks to update their password before they see the scary red message. So in the next phase of our project, we're introducing configurable password policies, and those are gonna be tied to permission groups in our system. So this will allow us to have varying strength requirements for passwords based on permission group. Patrons can continue using the lowest strength password requirements, but staff members and particularly admins will have more strenuous requirements for length and special characters. So I wanted to give a little bit more context into why we were approaching this solution. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got a ticket from somebody who was not able to log into the, uh, their staff client. And they said, you know, go ahead and log in as me. My password is one, two, three. And it's like, ooh, okay, first off, I didn't wanna know that. Second off, you shouldn't be able to do that. So we were thinking about, there's the global password strength requirements. And those apply to all the staff members and all the patrons equally. And we wanted to keep it so the patrons could still have their simple like one, two, three, four passwords, but then have more strenuous stuff for the staff. So that's why we uh, decided to go down this route. So we're currently in the testing stage of phase two in our development environment. We've created a new table in the database to store our three password policies. And we've gone ahead and linked all of our permission groups to those. The new policy data structure contains the password's regular expression, age requirements, and the hint. So for those who might not know, the regular expression is the piece of code that determines what stuff a password has to contain in order to be valid. So the three new password policies are dynamically loaded onto the patron edit screen so that the regular expression is applied as soon as the user's permission group has been updated. Since the policy contains a hint now, we also load that into a pop-up modal on the edit screen. So this way the editors aren't left guessing what the new requirements are. 
And if there's no policy, then the default org unit settings are applied instead. The last phase of this project will revolve around preventing the typical pitfalls that users have when selecting new passwords. We would store several of the user's previous passwords to create a password history. And then before a password change is committed to the database, we check it against the password history to make sure it hadn't been used before. And yeah, of course, they can just change one character and then get past this, but it's better than reusing the entire password all over again. So another thing we may look into is filters for instances of common dictionary words or stuff like the user's name or the date of birth. So these would be additional settings that we would apply to our password policies that are coming in phase two. And that is all she wrote. Are there any questions or any comments about the work we've done? Right from the back. Yeah, I, I like the idea of passphrases. Always have the, the concept of um, easy to remember, hard to guess. So yeah, I, I do like those. Oh, okay. Uh, the, uh, the comment was not to uh, filter out dictionary words because the uh, passphrase system is more efficient, I think. All right, so the, the question was whether this is going to be coming to the uh, main branch of Evergreen. And um, right now, phase one and phase two are both on the uh, working repo. Um, and I do have a pull request for phase one. And uh, once I've gotten phase two onto production and we've kind of done a smoke test on it, then I'll make a pull request for that part too. So we haven't, oh, okay, so the question was, what are we thinking about in terms of uh, multi-factor authentication? So this, this was kind of a request that was dropped on us not too long ago, and we haven't even started thinking about how we're actually going to implement it. But um, my idea would be that this would also be one of those settings that are applied to a password policy, like whether multi-factor is on versus off, but including multi-factor is a, a big ordeal. And I should say that, um... CW Mars has worked with Equinox in order to put together sort of a, a brief set of specs for what uh, MFA would look like. And so that's something that in our sort of thinking about it, that was the first place that we went was to look at that and sort of, um, you know, what is the thought that's come, you know, already. Um, and part of the question we have is, you know, our it, you know, is it going to be us that does this or is it, you know, how is this going to happen? Are we going to be sort of forced to roll this out or, you know, And so then based on CW Mars's proposal, Equinox's uh, sort of like uh, white paper based on that proposal, uh, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative uh, is, is work, working on multi-factor authentication for uh, Evergreen um, with NC Cardinal. And there is a, like a secondary investigatory phase that, that the Evergreen Community Development Initiative uh, is under contract for now. And if Ruth were here, I would bother her, but she's not. Um, so the, there is movement on that, but the decisions about how to implement that and many of the hurdles of, obviously we don't want to require patrons to have MFA um, have not been addressed yet, but there is movement on that. Uh, yes, it, it, the for us for a circ or a circ lead account, we still allow that. Um, beyond circ lead, if you get into branch administrator, system administrator, item cataloger, uh, bib cataloger, we don't allow them to have shared accounts. But for those circulation, you know, front of house type of accounts, that's yeah, they can still use same workstation, same. Um, the question was, may I ask how you handle staff accountability? The, the previous question was about, do you allow shared staff ones, uh, accounts? Um, that's a good question. I, uh, what, you know, the reason that we allow those shared staff accounts is because 
the individual member libraries who use those have said, this is what we want. And so really they are the ones that are, you know, dealing with our cash, you know, accounting, um, dealing with, you know, those sort of things that are happening, you know, overrides who marked these fines as, you know, forgiven or that sort of thing. So we actually aren't really too engaged in the accountability of that aspect. It's sort of like, if you want this, you know, then that's your can of worms. So the question. So the question is how who who's responsible for the follow through on uh, training for the grandfathered accounts. So we've traditionally and historically taken the approach that the library director is the um, they what they say goes. I want to okay. I'm looking at Katie to confirm. Um, so it is on them as the care and responsible for being the care and maintenance of their accounts that their staff um, take those classes and certifications. Um, so when we are going to be approaching them this, this cycle as people are expiring, we'll be asking them like, hey, because we did go through and check all the certificate, like who took the quiz. We have documentation around that. So do you want to speak more to that? So we rolled out the cataloger certification, uh, it did, like the classes debuted in the summer of 2020. So uh, staff were given it and we have a cataloging users group committee uh, that set the con, they sent the permissions for each level, they set the content for the classes, they created the content videos for the classes. So um, we did an extended period for all we it's an absolute requirement for new accounts. For existing accounts that had these higher permission levels, they were given a substantial period of time to be able to take the classes. Um, and we are just, just recently that we finished making sure that who, who has taken the classes is then noted in the account so that we can then look and see how many people we have who haven't. Um, and then, I think what we'll do is address those on a case by case basis. Is it a case where there, I'm sure there are many cases where they were, they're the cataloger. So they were assigned the highest level permissions when they migrated, they may not need them. Uh, they may only need serials permissions. And then we can address that with different permission groups. So um, we, we are there, the accountability step for that hasn't been put in place yet because we're still in the rollout phase. Uh, the question was, uh, what are you doing to about the ability for shared uh, login accounts to gain access to the reporter and harvest patron information? Um, you know, at this point, I, I, we, they all have reporter privileges. I don't know of a way other than restricting on or off the ability to use a reporter. Um, I think I've, I've heard something in one of the other uh, presentations or conversations here about um, adding granularity. I think maybe that was, yeah, that was in the permissions conversation about adding more granularity to uh, the reporter things. And I don't know whether that would be something where you just can't get access to uh, patron related information or whether it comes obscured. Um, but I think that's definitely a, a vulnerability um, because right now, you know, that again, if you're, if you leave the institution, you can get access to the ILS over the internet, you know, and you can get in, you have access to a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, for pails, um, 
library administrators can build templates and edit templates uh, and obviously run. Sur supervisors can run reports and view reports and everyone can view reports. And then I think only other, and then our original catalogers can also build templates. So it's, we're leaving it on the responsibility of the library director for a lot of the patron privacy stuff. Um, they they may comment in the chat because I know that our Sitka friends are are uh, attending remotely, but they their consortium the the BC Co op does have a waiver that they have the reports permissions broken out, and you have to do you at least have to sign the waiver. You may have to do additional training. Um, so there is there's there are ways that consortia are starting to deal with this, um, but yeah, definitely a concern. Um, so the question is how uh, the, re the required training has kind of been received. Um, so for PALES, uh, I want to say it's been very beneficial. Our quality of our bib records has significantly improved, I'm going to say. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think I think so. Um, a lot of an improvement in errors and things like that. Um, so, you know, they may not be super excited about it, but I think they see the benefit of it. And it's great for when staff start and are new and are new specifically to Evergreen. It's it's very easy to be just like, here are the classes, you know, you have to take them to get qualified, to get the permissions. So I think overall, it's been an improvement. Um, they, they kind of booed when I offered the idea to uh, recertify, but um, I don't think it'll be too painful. I think it may be a two or three question, maybe focusing on new functionality. I think that might be helpful, um, but sure. That would be really fun. Maybe we should do that. There is, oh, okay. There used to be, okay. It, like certificate. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, we rolled that out about probably three years ago, the cataloging best practices and the uh, assessments and that sort of thing. And there was also some grumbling, you know, like, oh, you know, this is going to be something that, um, you know, are you, am I going to lose my job because I can't pass this thing or something like that? You know, and one of the things that we say to people is you can take as many times as you want. It's open book. You know, we just want to know that we're all cooperating from the same shared set of understandings. And I think, you know, when you look at the variety of places that people who are working in libraries have come from, you know, a large uh, a number of them don't have, you know, MLSs, librarian degrees, that sort of thing. And so it's like, um, you know, there's some sort of colloquial habits and stuff like that. And we've migrated a whole lot of libraries in to the consortium over time. And so those, in order to have a, a, a quality functioning catalog where you can search and you know that the 245 is going to do this sort of thing, and you know your standards on this or that, you know, and, um, you know, it really has allowed for us to not undermine in other people's work. And also when it comes to sort of deduplication and that sort of thing, if you have, um, you know, standards where you, you know that whenever catalogers are touching those records, because they've come from that same sort of, you know, shared experience, that they're going to do the same thing, it helps with like deduping records and that kind of stuff. So I think by now, everybody is kind of on board with it. Um, you know, it took a little bit for people to kind of uh, not be intimidated, but, uh, you know, once we sort of um, had the first batch, it was like, all right, yeah, we can do this. No, this is an initial before we'll give you um, that level of privileges. And we used to have PDF things, but it was kind of a little bit of overhead and, and now we don't. <laughs> uh do we do it for admins or just catalogers at this point, just catalogers, but we have just started a uh, admin uh, training module. Um, and I heard somebody else does it. Is that you all? 
Okay. That's kind of a good idea in my opinion. Pine says it too. Okay. Other questions? Uh, so the question is, how long can staff still log in with expired passwords? And um, right now, they can keep on doing it as long as they want. Um, I know uh, Catherine Nesbitt told me yesterday at Forsyth that she kind of bugs people about it. Um, but at, at this point, we don't we don't uh, block people from doing stuff we might in the future. But for now, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not something that we're pursuing yet. Yeah, it is a consideration. Yeah, um, the, the set date is exposed to the uh, reporter so we can make reports about uh, how old people's passwords are and stuff like that. <laughs> Other questions? 